Association Malaysia. Our second panelist, and uh, I'm sure all of you know him very well, is Professor Ashok Seth, the Chairman, Cardiology Council 40s Group of Hospital from India, the current President for the Asia Pacific Society of Interventional Cardiology. Our fellows joining us, these two guys keep coming back for punishment, uh, is Dr. Chris Ku from the National University Heart Center Singapore, as well as Dr. Gufran Anand from Pakistan. The objectives today are quickly stated is a fellow's focus, but it's really useful for the whole care lab team, the seniors there, the nurses, the technicians and radiographers. We want to transmit simple and succinct advice, life-saving messages, when to look out for unusual causes and complications for ACS. It's meant to be a fun session, so there's no stupid questions. Please ask all the questions you want. And we respect honesty here and to show us that even our giants and champions can have complications in the cath lab. This webinar is copyrighted by the APSC and should not be used without the prior permission of the APSC. The views and opinions expressed in the webinar are those of the faculty and do not necessarily represent those of the APSC. This content is currently made available by Wanda Medicine, the APSC Facebook and YouTube pages live. For Singapore registered physicians, CME points will be submitted for attendees who are connected throughout the whole duration. And is also at the same time accredited for CME point regionally by EBEC for those attendees who attend the full session. You receive your certificate of attendance upon completing a survey sent by webinar, uh, email post webinar. For attendees uh, calling in, please uh, click on the Q&A button if you have any questions and we'll try to answer all of them. A pitch for upcoming webinars. Uh, next week, we have a new format, which is an APSC uh, journal club, where we will go through with our emerging cardiologists of tomorrow, landmark trials of how to critically appraise journals. Our first focus journal will be SGLD2 inhibitors in HFREF. On the 20th of May, we're going to host our next live bifurcation, uh, sorry, live uh, uh, cath lab workshop focusing on coronary imaging and calcified lesions. So let's get uh, started and we'll welcome uh, Professor Tan to share his first case of unusual causes and complications of ACS. Uh, Huichin, please. Thank you very much, uh, Jack. Uh for this opportunity again to share some of these interesting cases. I hope you can see the slides. Yeah, we can see well. Okay, so this is where I work in uh, NUH. Now, going to the first case, let's look at a 45-year-old Chinese male, cardiovascular risk factors of smoking, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. This is his uh, history uh, in 2003 when he presented with inferior myocardial infarction and then they went the PCI to his distal right coronary artery. So remember, this is 2003, many, many years ago. You can see that there is a thrombotic occlusion of the distal right coronary artery. He then underwent uh, exciser, which I'm not sure whether you remember. This is a thrombectomy devices uh, that we used to use in the past. And then after which he had a bare metal stent uh, implanted called the Zeta stent. And this was 2003. This was the result uh, immediately after the primary PCI in 2003. Uh, looks pretty good if you agree with me. Then he has been uh, asymptomatic since. A dobutamine stress echocardiogram that was done uh, three years later showed inferior regional wall motion abnormality with scarring. EF was preserved at 40%. Uh, he had a relook coronary angiogram uh, as part of a clinical study, I think, uh, the following month, and they showed the patent RCA stent. So he was continued on medical therapy, but he defaulted follow-up since. 10 years later, on the 2nd of April, 2013, he came in with sudden chest pain with shortness of breath for three days, which was worse on exertion. The dyspnea was not related to posture, and he had experienced symptoms of abdominal bloatedness as well. This is the ECG. So maybe we take a pause here. So you have a youngish man at what looks like a thrombotic uh, right occlusion, almost looked like a smoker's uh, inferior MI, stented with a bare metal stent, and uh, 10 years later has chest pain. So 
we'll go through the ECG first. Uh, Chris, maybe we'll have you start. Uh, what do you see on the ECG? So there are some Q-waves inferiorly, which is consistent with its O inferior infarct. Um, you can push that there are some borderline ST elevations in the inferior leads with some reciprocal changes in one in APL. Uh, but in the context of a previous Q waves there, um, I guess if he's having chest pain right now, then that will warrant me to think about whether we want to bring him to the cath lab. Other than that, I think there's some borderline LVH. Um, and yeah, that's it for now. Dr. Grufant, uh, would, would this qualify for thrombolysis, you think? So, uh, there are ECG changes, but there are Q waves in lead to 3 AVF, but there are ST depressions in V4 to V6 and 1 AVL. So, uh, as the patient has going on chest pain, but there are Q waves, so I think I need a previous ECG to see that there are Q waves are there or not. So, I are, I think if we need a further workup like drop on in for thermolysis. So yeah. do you think there's ST elevation in the inferior leads? Yes, so, there, so are, uh, there are ST elevation, but there are Q waves with that. So I think there's a old inferior MI. Yeah, so I think Huichim's question again was, does this qualify for a cath lab activation? I think... Uh, it looks suspicious, I would say, uh, for SE elevation, especially with some reciprocal light changes in one and AVL. So I think it, if the patient is having symptoms, should be brought to the cath lab. W would anyone else uh, have any comments? Uh, Gim Hui? Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, given the context of the presentation, although there are pre-existing Q waves, SE elevation, possibly reciprocal changes in the lateral leads, I think we should warrant to activate the cath lab to go in. And uh, is Ashok in now? Uh, so Ashok may have dropped out again. So which maybe you continue again. Okay, so we brought him to the cath lab. But before that, this is the uh, enzymes. Just a brief comment. Uh, all agree that it's elevated. Some kind of uh, marker infarction process going on. This is the left coronary artery. The so left maybe coronary go artery down. Yeah, we'll, we'll let the Huichin play the two, then maybe we we'll call for comments from Chris on the angiogram. So Chris, any comments on the angiogram? Looks like, a, looks like there's some disease in the mid-distal circle. Give me two kind of flow. Very small caliber, very diffuse. Um, yeah. But I don't know if that was what it looked like in the past. It was. So this is the deal. And also you uh, saw collaterals going from the left to the right system. Yeah. So I, I think that was the point to uh, highlight. And uh, that's why some operators actually do a diagnostic on the left side first before going in with the guider on the right. Now I think uh, that's one approach that some mm. operators use. Uh, which is this? Correct. So this is a uh, reocclusion of the RCA. But this time around more proximal. Yeah. So operator tried to do some uh, aspirations here with a uh, six French thrombuster, some uh, re-establishment of forward flow here. But there's still a lot of uh, thrombus inside it. So he used a number of balloons, small balloon, and then the escalate to larger size balloon and gave some 2B3 receptors of integrity into intracoronary. Really. So maybe I can take a, a pause here backwards uh, to ask Gim Hui if you see the previous imaging. Uh, if a uh, thrombectomy catheter uh, doesn't really restore flow well, would you go with larger balloons as your approach? Yeah, I think the primary intention is to get to re-establish flow. Given such a big uh, right coronary artery, very often the amount of thrombus extraction is very limited with the usual um, is the aspiration catheters that we have. Uh, so we have, of course, today the benefit of some other more uh, efficient thrombus extraction devices like Penumbra and so on. So that may be a consideration. Uh, if not, then I would think I might use not a big balloon, Small balloon just establish flow. 
And my main aim is to get flow. Even if it's not complete extraction of the thrombus, if I get flow, I might just hold on for that and use some form of pharmacotherapy therapy instead of going forward to try to uh, put a stand in a thrombus-laden uh, big vessel. Uh, uh, Prof Tan, your, your comments. Uh, I mean, yeah, your, I your next shot actually shows quite good results, but uh, would that be the primary approach, actually? Uh, I, I would do some thrombectomy, get some forward flow, and then uh, I, I wouldn't rush to putting uh, any metal stands in uh, somebody where flow is uh, uh, not clear and that there is a significant residual uh, thrombi within the coronaries. So I, I would just establish some flow and then give some uh, anticoagulant, antiplatelet, and then always bring him back. So there's no hurry here. Yeah, hi. Hello, guys. Yeah, okay, I'm, 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 I've joined you. The Zoom hey, was throwing, okay. throwing me out each time. The Zoom was throwing me out each time. So I missed the earlier part of this presentation, but I wanted to just come in to say that, yes, restoration of flow, but this is large bulky thrombus. And even if you restore, if you restore good Timmy 3 flow, it's great to just give, give uh, anticoagulation for a few days to dissolve the thrombus and come back and surprisingly you'll see a large bulk of thrombus may have actually disappeared. On the other hand, if you don't restore flow and say you've got TIMI-1 or TIMI-3 to, to flow and you've got a huge bulky thrombus, then of course you have either a mother or child to suck that thrombus out or give intracoronary 2B3, when, when I say 2B3, uh, I mean abseximab. Uh, and that uh, thrombus resolution with abseximab is more predictable than with other 2B3s. It's called, uh, so, so it's got dethrombosis. And finally, uh, I'd even use half dose TNK for large bulky thrombus, which are still causing TIMI one and two flow. Large balloons will only fragment the thrombus downstream, causing significant choking of the distal vascular bed. Thanks, uh, Ashok. I, I think my, my quick comments are this. I think you have a large vessel with huge thrombus burden. I am usually a bit more reluctant to use large balloons I think a small balloon creates some blood flow to restore some TIMI flow is uh, one approach. I like Ashok's suggestion about a deferred approach. Some uh, anticoagulation over a couple of days bring back with DAPT on board. Usually you see that a lot of the clots has cleared and you don't understand so much. Mm. The other thing I like to do is some form of uh, uh, more aggressive thrombectomy, as a, especially with angiojet, uh, <clears throat> but you may or may not need some distal protection, although the evidence is uh, weaker. So, uh, Richie, back to you. So, this is the final results of the uh, sequential balloon uh, inflation as well as uh, intracoronary uh, uh, integrity. So, there's some uh, dissections uh, at the proximal part of it, some moderate residual stenosis, but the operator decided that this is good enough uh, uh, results uh, in that acute setting. Was there a stand put in? Uh, I thought there was a stand, right? No stand. The stand is in the distal RCA, but not the proximal part. So there's a bit of dissection, a bit of residual stenosis in the proximal RCA, but there's no stand there. So there's a really? pure uh, the result. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Story is not over yet. This patient's uh, symptoms didn't go away, particularly for uh, his dyspnea. In fact, when we put him on the venti mass of 50%, his pulse oximetry is only 85%. When you step up to 100%, it's only 92%. And so, so you can see the uh, arterial blood gas down there. He is actually persistently in a state of hypoxemia. PO2 was about 50 on 50% and about 72 on 100%. So uh, any comments? Yeah, maybe you can get Chris to comment on the gases here, uh, especially on the 100% venti mouse. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, well, I guess it's in type 1 respiratory failure because that's a low PF ratio there with a total of only 72.2. Um, there's some element of hyperventilation as well. And that's why he's in respiratory alkalosis. But yeah, I think if we're talking about the venti mass uh, readings on the gas in 100%, I think that's my conclusion for now. Uh, Dr. Gufren, what, what would be your clinical thing you are looking out for now with this kind of gas? What's your next decision point? So uh, I would like to uh, do the echocardiogram to look for any abnormality which can cause this hypoxic respiratory failure. 
so uh, to look for any uh, complication that could occur because of uh, acute mi uh ashok yes so is that it right he certainly had a right sided infarction and his right heart would be failing what are his pressures lactates i mean there those are the important aspects mixed venous saturations those are the important aspects to guide us about the next aspect of uh, of therapy hmm Well, I don't okay, have a lactate at the time. Uh, this is quite a long time ago. I don't think I have a lactate, but this is the uh, the lab test but, result at uh, the time. Hmm. I think common things being common, I I am a bit surprised by the guess because the left side looks quite clean, and then you have a right sided infarction, but yeah, a fairly bad uh type one respiratory failure requiring high oxygen count. Although unlikely, I think the common things being common, you look for bad heart failure, I guess, yeah. and. Uh, you have to have a decision tree whether it needs invasive ventilation if you can't cope with this and uh, you have to make a decision that's why i think clinically you have to check the lungs see whether the lungs are wet or not i think that's one thing you can look out for um kim we you have any other comments just yeah, based on guess i agree with you i think we need to look at other causes uh, including the lung pathology as well uh, i'm interested to know the echo finding as well as also got to look at other things like pe and so on to look for it. The, the reason for the low uh, oxygen levels okay which in so your differential diagnosis here will be heart failure and uh, pulmonary embolism and things like that right so we did a chest x-ray first so comments from uh, chris first is this a heart failure or non heart failure chest x-ray doesn't look convincing for heart failure uh, the lung wall the diaphragms are fine the lung edges are okay Yeah, I wouldn't say this looks convincing for heart failure. Uh, Doctor Gufen. So uh, it's not convincing for a heart failure. I agree with Chris. Mm. So not heart failure, no pulmonary congestion uh, is reported. So we did uh, CT pulmonary artery as well. We were worried about pulmonary embolism here, and there was no evidence of pulmonary emboli as well. But there was a reflux of contrast into the IVC and hepatic veins in keeping with a right heart failure. A little bit of small bilateral pleural effusion, not enough to account for this uh, hypoxemia. So we do echo, right? Okay. So let's see what the echo show. So maybe you can start with Dr. Gufren this time, uh, so, for you to make some comment on the echo images. Yes. So better start. Parasternal long axis view, and uh, <laughs> what 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 is crossing your mind, Doctor Grufen, when you do pick up an echo? What are you looking for nearly post uh, RCA infarction that can cause severe hypoxemia? What are the things that crosses your mind? So mitral regurgitation could be one of the possibility, and then uh, oh, acute MR mechanical complications. MR, Anything uh, else? Yeah. BSR could be the one of the possibilities. Good. A BSR. Anything else? And RV infarction could be, but uh, it's not so much hypoxemia explained with that. Yeah. So maybe more with shock, but it's also possible, especially the EVA is very poor. So what do you see here then? So. Uh, on the pastoral long axis view, I can appreciate. I think there's a. uh it could be a vsr um i think you can't make a diagnosis on just plain 2d but inferior wall looks like it's not moving or yeah. a kinetic ef looks rather impaired maybe the ra looks a bit bloated but uh maybe is there any other images we'd like to see no pericardial effusion i think but what do you think of the ef of both the lv and the rv Do you agree that the systolic function of both is severely impaired? Yep. yep. Yeah. Any other comments on echo? I'm not an echo guy, though. Kim Wei, you got any comments or the? Nothing more to add, I think. Okay. So maybe yeah. the next image. Then. In short. So you worry about mitral regurgitation, right? But there was no mitral regurgitation. Okay. So. Yeah, this is a four chamber view. So, Chris, uh, your your turn. What do you want to see here? 
Okay, so I'm I'm going to guess that this is, I mean, this is just guessing that we're looking at RB infarction. And then why you have this hypoxemia? Because you can see an a, a atrial septal aneurysm there. Makes me wonder if there's a PFO thing. And then therefore you get a RV infarction, RV failure, and you get persistent hypoxemia from Correct. stunting across the PFO. Yeah. So Ashok gave you the thumbs up. Uh, yeah. That's probably Ashok's uh, first guess as well. Yeah. Correct. Okay. So uh, Gimwe, anything you you like to see color, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, there's no left to right shine. No left to right, Sean. Okay. Uh, right to left. Prof. Right to left. Can't see any color. Right to left. Okay. So maybe hmm. not. <laughs> okay. Don't Anyone see any uh, want... color flow across the interatrial septum. Is, is there any color flow across the interventricular septum then? Uh, no, no, no. No. No murmur None. that we can hear. And this patient's breathlessness is, uh, is not... Uh, he, so he gets breathless when he lies down. He, he, sorry, he doesn't get breathless when he lies down. So this is platinum near here. This is not a top near here. So he gets breathless when he sits up. So he has to actually lie down to feel better. Okay, Kim Hui. So it's a bit like a platinum autodeoxia situation. Lost at the moment, yeah. Uh, Chris, you would like to revise your diagnosis now? I, 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 I don't know. I still think it's the diagnosis, but I mean, the absence of any shun makes me change my diagnosis. But I think that's still the underlying diagnosis I have here. So intracardiac shunt. So anything we can do further? What test would you like to do to prove your hypothesis? Maybe a bubble study. Or TE as well. TE. So maybe challenge with a bubble study if you can't uh, do a TE in someone who's hypoxic without tubing him. Hmm. So is that the right track, reaching? I, I also don't know. So <laughs> I think bubble study is the easiest. But you hmm. can just inject it, uh, get some agitated saline, inject it by anticubital vein, and then you see. So this is what we did. Hmm. So we did see, see yeah. bubbles flowing through the uh, right. interatrial septum area into yeah. the uh, left chambers. Sure. Pretty nice so pictures, actually. Yeah, very nice. Uh, so it's still an intracardiac shunt, though. Yeah, it's a right to left shunt. Yeah, that's right. You don't see on color, but you can uh, quite clearly see it on the bubbles study. Okay, so what is the diagnosis? Uh, Chris, I think you got the diagnosis right. Would you like to say that again? I think it's a it's RV infarction with RV failure complicated by a right to left shunting with a PFO. That's correct. So what's happening here, actually? So this is the echo report. The echo shows that, that there's severe left and right uh, systolic dysfunction. Uh, there is a right to left interatrial shunting through a PFO seen on agitated saline contrast injection. So we all know that PFO occurs in about 25% of the general population. Anatomically, PFO represents a channel through which a unidirectional blood flow from the right to the left atrium may occur. But most patients are asymptomatic because the defect is flat line and does not permit a significant left to right shunting but right to left shunting can occur in the situations of increased pulmonary arterial pressure, increased right heart chamber pressures and inferior chamber uh, flow deviation. So PFO, as we know, can uh, cause paradoxical embolization, migraine and respiratory failure. So this patient, what happened here is that the, uh, he's got an infected right ventricle, second uh, uh, insult already, which increased the uh, RA pressure to the point that it exceeds the RA pressure. And so, this condition could be exacerbated by tricuspid regurgitation and elevated PA pressure as well. Mm -hmm. So the best treatment to, to prevent these things from happening is, of course, to quickly revascularize or occlude the RCA. But because this is a second infarct, so I think the damage is pretty significant for him. Uh, sometimes people use uh, nitroglycerin, which we usually don't prescribe for RV infarction. To, but in this case, you will prescribe IV or GTN to decrease the RV preload or inhaled nitric oxide to decrease the RV afterload and RA pressure without causing systemic vasodilation. Uh, 
In this sort of situation, there are a few things that you mustn't do. One is to consider a positive uh, pressure breathing to improve arterial oxygen saturation or give patients a, a high volume load here as you would in the RV infarction because both of these will result in the increased RA pressure and that's going to be bad for the patient. More shunting occur. And also IABP is not used in this situation because when you decrease the LV afterload, again, you increase the shunt flow across the uh, PFO. So, uh, so you're actually very limited in your treatment here. So this is a right heart cath that we uh, decided to uh, do for the patients. The right atrium was 25, left atrium 21. So right atrium clearly uh, higher than the left atrium pressure here. Pulmonary artery was about 40 to 26. And so we decided to do the closure of the uh, PFO. So this was a procedure performed and the uh, operator sized it uh, to about seven millimeter and then they deploy a uh, nine millimeter uh, unplugged occluder for this patient. And so this is the occluder that was deployed under TE guidance. And this is a TE picture. So we give some uh, agitated saline again, there's some residual right to left shunt, but less, less number of bubbles going across. Uh. And so this was a transesophageal echocardiogram findings. Immediately, patient symptoms improve. Oxygen saturations improved from 88% to 95% on room air. So he continued to be well. There was, uh, uh, he, he was uh, successfully discharged uh, three days later uh, following the closure of the PFO. So he went on to leave for another five years before his uh, chronic heart failure caught up with him. Uh, but as far as this episode is concerned, he responded to quickly to the uh, PFO closure. Thanks, uh, Wichim. Actually, I'd like to ask then uh, quickly before you present the next one. I, I know that this is, PFO is fairly common, but I, I this is the first time I'm seeing this though. Ashok, do you have uh, experience with this? It's on the phone then. Yeah. yeah, it's on the phone. So maybe you can present the rest we'll come back to that. Can I, can I also maybe just ask that, uh, would anyone consider if this patient is not too decompensated to, to support and hopefully the RV will recover and then he, the patient, patient may not need a closure or a PFO? Right, so I think he, was, uh, he remained symptomatic for three days. So most RV usually improve within the first day or so. But we gave him three days, symptoms continue to be persistent and then continue to be hypoxemic. That's why we, we, we decided to go ahead and close it uh, three days later. So it wasn't done as an immediate uh, procedure, even though we got the diagnosis very early on. Do you have to bring him back to stand the RCA in the end or just left it as a- uh, In the end, uh, he was just treated uh, medically. Okay, Actually, this has been reported as well. Uh, so there are a number of case reports that report the same thing. So this is also another one, the 81 year old lady, also an inferior myocardial infarction, also TE showing a PFO with a right to left shunt, and then they had a closure of his PFO and with uh, good results. So this is, uh, this is not new as well. So the conclusion here is that in the inferior myocardial infarction complicated by cyanosis and hypoxia, particularly not improving with increasing oxygen supplementation, a patency of a foramen ovale or unknown ASD causing intracardiaction should be considered. So TTE or TE will be done to determine the existence of PFO and management, uh, management should be directed to improve the RV performance. So early revascularization, revascularization is the key and then reducing RV and atrial pressure through a preload reducing agents here. But if all measures fail to improve the patient's condition, then percutaneous closure of PFO should be performed. So I have some uh, questions, but maybe I call upon Ashok to... Uh... So there's just one comment I had about this regime is the fact that, sorry, I was on the phone, uh, some sick patient. But then uh, yeah, we just have to be cautious about the PFO closure in these cases as well, because the right side is being decompressed by that. Uh, the high PA pressures are being, the high PA pressures are being decompressed into the LA. And sometimes when you close this, you end up with right heart failure, intractable right heart failure. I think those are the cautions about... Uh, about uh, this sort of a situation. Hmm. So the you, other question you wait I have for a few days before you consider closing. Correct. Absolutely, absolutely, and you wait for the improvement in RV function as well. 
uh, because you've revascularized it, you'll get an improvement in artery function. You support the patient and give it a few days and then close it. Yeah, good point. Acute again. closure on a poor RV function can actually precipitate a whole right ventricular dysfunction. Hmm. Which in my, my point was that acutely, if the patient does decompensate with RV failure, especially with hypertension, uh, and the usual treatment is fluid loading, what is your advice in that circumstance? When somebody is hypoxic here, this is a uh, shunt process going on. Uh, so loading or with fluid becomes a control indication here. But it becomes hypotensive and does need fluid. Maybe we need inotropes here, I think. That, that is a tricky problem. I think sometimes uh, you may even need to escalate to uh, hemodynamic support mm -hmm. uh, beyond IVP. Yep. RV so is a bit difficult. So again, a very, very interesting case. This is the first time I've seen it. Then. You help me think about it the next time I see such a case uh, of RV infarction because I have not seen it. I was just about to ask Ashok because PFO is relatively common. RV infarction is not uncommon. But I must say I have not encountered this before though. Ashok, have you? Yeah, one. And that's that's how you know I talked about the decompensation of the right ventricle. If one closes that too early, we had to support that right ventricle. Then on ECMO after that, so it was it was quite a disaster to close it early. And then when we went through the literature, we realized that you let the LV, the, the RV recover a bit, it actually becomes a much better task to close it at that time. Otherwise, just think that you support the patient because decompression is happening of the right ventricular pressures. Thanks, Ashok. Uh, you need to spend three times more time in the cath lab than me to see one case. So uh, that's, that's good. Thanks, Richie. Yeah. The next case, Yeah, once please. you see one, you will never forget this. Yeah, I think so. Yes. I'm going to go to case two and see how everybody does. This is a 43-year-old relatively uh, young lady. She's got a past history of ASD with surgical patch closure of done 15 years ago. At the time it was done because there was a large uh, QPQS uh, shunt of three to one and a PA pressure of 80. She actually had uh, three pregnancy, the last pregnancy of which uh, she had a history of biventricular heart failure, but she survived the entire pregnancy and, and, and was well. Uh, she now come in with a complaint in 2004 with a symptom of chest pain and breathlessness after a meal, or a walk of 200 meters on a level ground, or a one flight of stairs. And sometimes this could also be associated with fainting spells. So this was a physical examination findings at the time. Uh, hemodynamics generally okay. There was a left parasternal heave uh, and a loud second heart sound. And there was a bi bilateral uh, mild or lower limb swelling as well. This was an ECG. So maybe we can this time around start with Dr. Grufren on an ECG reading. So uh, in ECG, there is uh, ST depression in the AVF, V4, V5, V6. There are RBB spectrum and T wave inversion in V2 to V6. So maybe some form of right ventricular hypertrophy type pattern. Chris, uh, what's your read and pertinent to this? So I think there's a prominent R wave in the V1 and you can see the inverted T waves V1 to V4 at least V5, V6 and that's consistent with RV, uh, RV hypertrophy with some form of RV strain. Um, I don't know if it's relevant, but it seems like there's also S1, Q3, T3 in this case. Um, although she's not really tachycardic, uh, but that also just makes me wonder about the in this context here. Okay, uh, I think that you... the three is more yeah. well, RS rather than a Q. Maybe Chris, I thought. Probably, yeah, but yeah, you're right. Okay, so uh, the axis, uh, Chris, you think uh, right or left? Uh, right axis. So right axis RVH with strain. This was some of the lab results, uh, particularly trying to look for a uh, cause of uh, pulmonary hypertension here. A number of uh, uh, autoimmune markers were performed, uh, but they were all negative. Anti-pro BMP was 4, 417. So not, not really spectacular here. Okay. I'm going to show you the echo now. 
which I'm sure you'd like to see. Any comments? So maybe we'll jump back to Chris first. I think the RV is dilated. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the septum isn't moving normally. There's some shudder, which makes you think there's some element of pulmonary hypertension. Again, consistent with the history. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what the makeup of the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve uh, looks a bit hinted, and I don't know what element of MR with that. Yeah, it does look like some kind of sand like movement. Uh, anything to add on, Dr. Kufren? Uh, I agree with Chris, there's an RV dilation. Uh, Very good. Nothing to... This is a short exit view. Uh, Dr. Grufren, any comments? What do you think of the interventricular septum? But there's a D-shaped interventricular septum. So that would waste because of increased RV. Volume or pressure? And increased RV. I think there's increased RV, uh, RV pressure. So you are suspecting that she has primary hypertension, right ventricular hypertrophy from what is uh, presented so far? Chris, anything else from you? Probably not, but it looks like it's drought systole and diastole. Yeah. So both volume as well as pressure. That's what you're saying now. So it looks like both to me. Okay. Uh, Kim Hui? Yeah, none. Both. Nothing much there. Okay. Um, okay. Another view? Anything striking uh, here? We'll start back with the fellows first. Chris? The right atrium is clearly dilated as well. So increased right atrial pressure, but nothing more than that. Agree. Okay. So this was the echo finding. The PASP was 73 uh, millimeter mercury. The LA was dilated. The right tumor was dilated. The BA was dilated. EF was normal. When we compare the patient's echo in September, which is about two years ago, uh, PASP at that time was 62. Uh, later one was 68, but this is the latest 73 uh, millimeter mercury. So some degree of pulmonary hypertension. Now remember this patient also had a... Uh, sort of uh, angina symptoms on after meals and walking and so forth. So a decision was actually made to do a right and left heart cath for her. Would you all agree? Yeah, I think the, the right heart cath particularly is very, very useful here. Yeah, so this is a right heart cath. Any comments? So, uh, I think it's good to get some comments now. Uh, we'll start with Chris first. Uh, what would you look for and why in the right heart cap in this lady? So slowly looking, I think the, you can see that the right atrial pressures are high. The right ventricle pressure looks elevated as well. The PA, I'm not sure what the mean is, but I'm sure the mean PA is actually elevated as well. And that will be consistent with pulmonary hypertension. Um, and when you use nitric oxide, Look, I don't think, I don't think there's much drop in the resistance. So, so in terms of PBR, what, what is considered significant or reversible drop? How many percent? I can't remember that offhand. I'm disappointed, Chris. Dr. Griffin? <laughs> yeah, I also don't remember. I think is it 10% or 10, 10 or 20? I, I believe it's 20%. Uh, Dr. Ashok, any comments about what else you want to know from the right heart? No, I don't think I have any comments here. Okay. Uh, it's which consistent means? with pulmonary hypertension and, and mm. so forth. Would you think? Yeah. And it's not so reversible with nitric oxide. That's right. That's right. I mean, it seem to be, written, you know, is it primary pulmonary hypertension? We don't know. This is a left heart uh, cap, the coronary angiogram. 
was but, but before I've got was there any evidence of connective tissue disorders in this lady? Not sense? that we can find. No, not that we, we can tell. Did you think that the left ventricular mus muscle was speckled and thickened? Uh, no, nothing unusual. The right ventricle, the yeah. right ventricle muscle. The right ventricle okay. is certainly dilated. Yeah. I, I didn't think I saw speckling, but what I thought, I don't know where's the echo setting. The pericardium sac looks a bit bright. Uh, mm -hmm. And with the previous history of surgery, I was thinking whether there's some form of other things like constriction as well, but it could be just a echo setting. Mm. But I, I did see that your lab test included some complement as well yes. as uh, yes. uh, autoimmune markers which are negative. Yeah. Yes. Okay, let's uh, go on. This is the right, looks okay. So this maybe we lamp. can take a pause for Dr. Gufren. Uh, what do you see here? So I can appreciate there is significant stenosis and osteal LED. Osteum LED or left main? Osteal, osteal left main, sorry. Uh, Chris, is this significant? Yeah, looks significant. Okay. Uh, Kim Hui, what, what do you think? Yeah, there's eyeball. definitely yeah, there's definitely a constriction or narrowing of the uh, at least the body of the left main. And if you look, if you notice the rest of the coronary tree are actually quite pristine. Uh, really would like to know whether it's atherosclerotic disease or could even be compressive disease. Given the primary palm hypertension, I think that you have to consider. Con Compression by the primary artery as well. Okay, that's an extremely good thought as well. Richin? Yeah, so so we do a. This is a, another view. Still showing the same phenomenon, isn't it? That mean. Yes, but this is this is a young lady, and that that's that's a spurious left main. It's, it's obviously you can differentiate it by a number of methodologies, including a CT. Uh, hmm. So you would do a and, and, and IVUS, a CT and an IVUS, either of them would actually. So we do an IVUS first. You know, yeah. I recall one patient that presented it with osteolactin. Yeah. So, uh, so we did an IVUS here. Again, you show some kind of extrinsic compression, compression of the osteo. Yeah. There's, uh, there's not much of an atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis in the left main artery. I don't have the live picture, but this is the... Uh, this is the still picture of the uh, osteum left me. But uh, Wichin, can I just take a pause here? I, I don't know whether Kim Hui can comment because it doesn't look like what I'm seeing is a palmary artery compression. What, what do you make of this still picture? Not too sure actually. What, what is that arrow is pointing to? Um, because it's still image, it's hard to make out what you're looking at actually. Mm. Just, just pointing to the artery, that's all. Can't make much uh, of the this one, yeah. but uh, definitely there's not much in terms of plug. So it's definitely it's an extrinsic disease that's causing it. I think that as I should say, CT will be a great uh, complement to know what's going on. Anything else you want to do to this uh, particular lesion? Uh, oh, you could do it FFR. There's no atherosclerosis, yeah, but there is there is a kink, and that kink. Is it significant? Quite often, well, not uh, not uncommonly, the left pain does arise and then takes a downward turn to cause that kink. That's where there's no atherosclerosis, but is there ischemia happening of the left ventricle? But that, that would be relevant in this sort of situation. So until now, Asha, what are you thinking of? Uh, what is causing this extrinsic compression? Till now, it would just be pulmonary artery. That would be my first thought. So, okay, so we'll go, we'll go down the line for everyone to commit to something. So, Chris. I think that the, I'll, I'll go with that, but the left main looks a bit long. So I, I mean, I don't know whether it looks like it's going through some anomalous route, although I think it looked like the ostium was in the right place. But it makes you wonder whether it's an anomalous left main that's being compressed by the PA. Yes. Uh, Gimhui? 
I agree. Definitely, that's one of the thought. This possibility of the compression, correct? Uh, Doctor Gufran. Yes, I am also thinking the same. The pulmonary artery compression. Yeah. Definitely. Okay, I I have no clue, so I will skip. So, which <laughs> Would you do FFR then, uh, Jack? Um, I you think I'll doing? do FFR instead, actually. <clears throat> uh, but if I have okay. FFR, I will do the FFR then. Because uh, I, I predict if uh, IVA shows no intrinsic compression, then you have to decide whether you need to stent it or not. So the FFR looking for ischemia would justify it. But I would probably not do it at the same setting because I need to know what's doing the compression, I guess. So if it's pulmonary artery, as yes, what people suggest, uh, do we stand the left mean in this circumstance? I, I think if it's still functionally significant, uh, it's still possible to stand it, I, I, I think. Uh, but I have no experience. Ashok? So, so no experience on the left main, but certainly experience on the right side. Um, the stents, uh, treatment of the pulmonary hypertension is the first. If it's, if, see, we've got to still find, do the CT, find out what's the cause. I think the stenting part is a much later issue, provided there is ischemia. But by the way, balloon expandable stents can get compressed and these, these, these unresolved uh, external, uh, if there's unresolved external compression. So it's not the greatest of the things. I've done it for the right coronary artery going between the pulmonary artery and the aorta and have got a reasonable result. But that's when I reviewed the literature and it's one of the not so good things to do with the balloon expandable stents. So if, if it's a compression, maybe if it's a normal lifts, maybe. So I think uh, which, uh, anyone else has experience? Uh, Kim Hui? No, no, I've seen a lot of anomalous because I do CT, but almost never see that one that's symptomatic. In this particular case, if you've got combination of anomalous uh, left main in between the two main arteries plus the main, main palmar artery, which is dilated, that's definitely a recipe for compression. So can this cause angina? Possibly, oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. EMI? Occasionally, rarely, that also happens. Death? And as you know, can it cause death or sudden death? Oh yeah, no, well, <laughs> not 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 all the left mains going through the through the, the yeah. but the ones which go between the pulmonary artery and the aorta can cause uh, those anomalous left main can cause sudden death. The right ones, absolutely, it's rare for them to happen. Left main, yes. So may, maybe I think uh, I, I I thought when would we even bring out such a case if it's the case, I think the malignant left means whether it's arising from the right calves looping backwards or uh, uh, the other way around. I think those are the more malignant ones if it's uh, left mean. But like Kim Wee says, a lot of the CT specimens you see are incidental, and a lot of the reported case series post mortem are uh, just case series. And they only pick up if they are less than 40, actually. So uh, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I think uh, we think that the more malignant ones are the left main that loops around. In this case, the left main still arise from the left calf, doesn't it? So yes. it yeah, it does. But that's, this, is, this doesn't look like an anomalous left main, but it certainly could be arising still between, between the, the pulmonary artery and the, it still could be compressed by the pulmonary artery. Mm. And so so this that's the best become, bet, which uh, everyone is thinking is uh, compression by, compression the, by the pulmonary yeah. artery in her setting, which is very reasonable, actually. So, uh, so you're correct. This is the diagnosis. This is osteolethmine compression in pulmonary hypertension. So what, what's happening here? Actually, this has been reported uh, many, many times. It's a definite entity. Uh, we have seen it in uh, many cases. Patients presenting with angina uh, in the setting of pulmonary hypertension, and you wonder what's going on. So actually, a, a good test here is a cardiac MRI. You could also do a CT scan as well. So, so we did a cardiac MRI for this patient, and there was a clear uh, compression of the uh, pulmonary uh, of the left main artery by the uh, pulmonary artery, by the dilated uh, right pulmonary artery here. So uh, oftentimes when we and when a patient with pulmonary hypertension complained of angina, we just attribute it to an increase in our match uh, metabolic demands of the hypertrophy and overloaded RV. 
actually 27 to 40 percent of patients with pulmonary hypertension and angina have left main uh, artery compression. And left main artery compression have been known to be associated with myocardial infarction, left ventricular dysfunction, arrhythmia, and sudden death. Mind you, 25% of death in the patients with pulmonary hypertension are sudden death. So you wonder whether they actually have uh, left main artery uh, compression or not. And these are the conditions that have been uh, reported to cause extrinsic uh, left main coronary artery compression. Our patients has got atrial septal defect, pulmonary hypertension, ventricular septal defect, PDA, fellow tetralogy, AV septal defect, idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, and uh, pulmonary hypertension due to uh, cystosomiasis and Sony. So all this have been reported uh, to cause uh, left mean occlusion through uh, pulmonary hypertension. And so a CT scan is uh, really helpful here. Uh, there are actually four, uh, if you look at the CT scan, which is a relationship of the uh, pulmonary artery to that of left mean artery, if you see these two pattern here of dislocation or causing significant stenosis, then it predicts a very high chance of a patient having really severe left mean coronary artery stenosis of more than 50% confirmed by selective angiogram. So these are very important uh, CT findings uh, for patients with pulmonary hypertension. Indeed, if you have a PA, of more than 40 millimeter, it predicts a high likelihood of a left main coronary artery significant stenosis, sensitivity of 83% and specificity of 70%. So question here is, should you revascularize such patient? This patient has got symptom. You don't know whether it's from the uh, RV. You don't know whether it's from the uh, compressed uh, left main here. I think doing an FFR is quite reasonable. Uh, there have been many, many reports of revascularization of a extrins, uh, of a compressed uh, left main artery in the patient with pulmonary hypertension. This PCI is preferred to CABG just simply because of bypass surgery uh, uh, associated with a higher risk because of general anesthesia and the need for CP uh, bypass. Not very safe in the patient with pulmonary hypertension, particularly those with severe pulmonary hypertension. And the alternative procedure to a PCI is a surgical reduction plasty of the pulmonary artery. Actually, PCI is very well tolerated in this case. Uh, it improved the symptoms and resulted in uh, favorable long-term outcomes. But uh, there's a bleeding risk involved here because oftentimes these patients may be on anticoagulant for their pulmonary hypertension. So you want to avoid or prolong the APT in these cases. So what happened to this particular uh, young lady? Uh, she had an FFR that was measured. Uh, it was 0.88. So we reckon her symptoms uh, may not be due to the uh, left main artery. And we did uh, also a diperidomal myocardial perfusion scan just to make sure that we're not missing anything. And it was also uh, negative for ischemia, so uh, no uh, perfusion uh, defect here. So we, we decided to leave that uh, osteo left main uh, narrowing alone. Uh, we published this particular thing uh, case in the European Heart Journal and so what happened to her was that uh, she has been under the care of a pulmonary hypertension team. Initially, she was on warfarin, digoxin, and spironolactone. That was way back in 2004. 2008, uh, sildenafil was added. 2014, 10 years later, bosentan was added. To, to, to 2021, ambrisantan was uh, uh, used to replace a bosentan. And now she's actually still alive. Uh, as uh, she's still in the New York Heart Association class two, she's on low dose uh, home nocturnal oxygen therapy. Her latest study echo done last year showed a PSP of 61. Remember, she came in with 73 uh, in 2004. That's almost like uh, 17 years ago. So she's still alive and she's actually responding to this modern medical therapy for pulmonary hypertension. So this is a case of uh, angina in the patient in pulmonary hypertension. Thanks, Richim. Again, uh, first for me. Uh, maybe one last comment from Gimui, who does a lot of CT. A great case, really. I really like this. But I just want to make a note because the, there is definitely an extrinsic compression of the left main. And at baseline, there's some stenosis, which physiologically may not be significant. But we know that the ischemia induced by this kind of uh, compression of the main but so usually happens during exertion when there's expensive dilatation of the main arteries. So whereas our physiological assessment that happens at rest, so we may not be truly uh, predicting the risk of ischemia during exertion. So I think we, if patients are symptomatic, I just thought maybe we should re also consider revascularization in these kind of patients. 
I, I think there was a stress, although the premium, just to highlight that, I think very few cath lab have a bicycle to look at it uh, and uh, on table stress. But a uh, point well taken, uh, which uh, give me. Uh, any other last comments for this case? Very interesting again. So, so give me you will revascularize in the absence of proven ischemia by conventional means. I mean, not at that stage, but if the patient continues to be symptomatic, I would really consider. Because I have always this issue when patients who have got these malignant vessels and what we should do for them, they are usually quite asymptomatic. So we, I usually leave them alone. But I have seen colleagues who actually send these patients for bypass surgery just because of a malignant cause of the vessel, mm -hmm. I, which I thought was probably not necessary. Correct. Yeah, I, I don't want to get to that uh, because mm -hmm. we have time for one last case, but that's a whole topic by itself. And uh, I think unless you demonstrate ischemia, I'll also be hard-pressed to offer more invasive approaches uh, for those malignant causes, uh, coronary artery, or in this case. So, uh, which maybe we move in. I'd like to hear from Ashok, man. Ashok, would you revascularize this patient given all the stress findings? Uh, since you are the wise man here. Or... No, I'm not the wise man. <laughs> you know, these are cases where there are no wise men to tell you, frankly. These are <laughs> amazing cases. They're once in a lifetime case. But, uh, you know, we just sometimes have to go by, uh, by, by understanding the literature as well as understanding the patient. If one was able to see, one doesn't have to make these decisions on the table. One actually does it beyond that. So it's not as if you did an IVUS and you did an FFR and then decided to stent it. You actually have to understand whether these patients do get symptoms, what sort of, are they progressive? And not all patients have, a, death has been reported, but it's not that every patient dies. And then the treatment of that pulmonary hypertension is also as equally important. So if the patient was very symptomatic, then would one would actually do some form of a graded exercise nuclear scan and then decide on the basis of that. But I don't think I'd be jumping in for revascularization of these patients unless it was very clear that they had intractable angina and we weren't getting the pulmonary hypertension better and that that was the only cause for angina in such a patient. We comment. Shall I proceed, uh, Jack? Yeah, please let's uh, go to the last case. Young man, again, 38-year-old Chinese male, has a family history of IHD. A father uh, had IHD, but died of stroke at age 54. So he presented to uh, the outpatient clinic. It's actually from KL, Malaysia. So come over for consult. Two months history of chest pain and dyspnea on climbing steps and exercises. He had actually had a stand done before, two years ago, for similar symptom. So this is a recurrence. This was a blood investigations. Any, any the, comments? Uh, mm. oh, from uh, Chris, maybe? Not much, but the urea seems markedly higher. That's the only thing that I can pick up. Normal creatinine, but very high urea counts. Is that what you picked up? Uh, that's, uh, that, that's just a bit strange. That's the only thing. How about the total triglyceride then? I mean, it's elevated, but we see that in clinic as well. Okay. Yeah, which in? This is the ECG on, uh, on presentation. Dr. I mean. Dr. Gufren, with this history and this ECG, what do you make of it? Your, your first impression will do. So there are ST elevation and two AVF, but these are uh, otherwise no other abnormality found. So do you think this is normal? Within normal variants or this is abnormal? So it's the, it seems to be like early polarization like ST elevation. So could be early depolarization. That's your that's your take, right? Okay. Which I think it's just normal ECG. But uh, we did a stress echo for him. Uh, uh, there was hypokinetic uh, lateral and inferior wall segment unchanged with nitrates. Uh, and so the conclusion of the echo report was that there was evidence of ischemic heart disease. So of course the next thing is to do angiogram, right? Do you all agree? Uh, Huichim, I missed how old was this patient? What was his presentation? 
38 year old history of PCI two years ago in mm. Malaysia. Mm. Then coming back here again though, with symptoms of chest pain and exertional breathlessness. Okay. Yeah, so we, which in my, my take is that actually with this history, a calf upfront is also possible with history of PCI. Yeah. What do you think? Um, so we'll, we'll go down to Chris who's laughing so hard. <laughs> uh, I mean, I just wasn't expecting this. Uh, I think you can see a lot of aneurysms. Uh, makes you wonder if the proximal location, whether it might be history of Kawasaki. Okay, so a lot of aneurysms and uh, left main LED, uh, thinking of Kawasaki's disease. Dr. Gufren, anything else from you? It seems like there are huge aneurysms in left main LED. Okay. Which in? The stain appears to be in this location right here, in the mid LED. Beyond the stenot, there's a narrowing proximal to the stand, huge aneurysm, and also still uh, LED narrowing, if I think. Also, some collaterals to the right circulation looks like. Hmm. So this is the right. From a coronary perspective, what would you do? Uh, Jack. Maybe since the stand was done by Gim Hui, we'll ask him. <laughs> I'm going to check which of my colleague did this. <laughs> yeah, so definitely that's almost like a two vessel or three vessel disease. Main thing that attracted her was this large aneurysmal involvement of the left main LED as well, with few stenotic. So it's triple vessel disease there. Um, so I think that this man, although he's young, I think there will be some issues you want to do a PCI because of this discrepancy between the vessel and the aneurysmal segments, uh, some of the stand placement will be very precarious because you might have to go into the aneurysmal segment. So I think first uh, of hand, this patient, I probably may want to consider a CABG as one option because it's definitely symptomatic and there's ischemia as well and it's multivessel disease as well. Uh, Ashok, your experience in this group? So had it not been for that left main bifurcation and discrepancy, I would have just treated, if it hadn't, let's assume that this was the presentation with a stenosis, which could be stented. This would be stent and then treat with the uh, uh, antiplatelets subsequently, low dose, a single antiplatelet and low dose anticoagulation, the NOACs. Uh, but keeping in mind what just uh, Gim who said uh, about uh, triple vessel disease, it's very reasonable to consider surgical revascularization because of the discrepancy in treating that left main and still leaving him with lots of ectatic segments, which would be a nidus for subsequent clot formation, thrombosis. And again, it's difficult to match those segments in any sensible manner uh, to the dilated segments. So it's not going to be an adequate bifurcation job, especially on the left main. So maybe I'd like to ask Ashok, the other common questions asked is, is there a risk of perforation for such coronary aneurysm? So, so uh, you know, I've treated a lot. One of the cases I'm writing up as well. Uh, a reasonable number of such cases get treated. I've still not seen, I've seen embolic episodes happening from aneurysms, uh, treated large giant aneurysms with multiple stent grafts, super, you know, uh, telescope stent grafts but have not seen a single perforation from a yeah. giant aneurysm. So, so that's why the algorithm is fairly vague when you get to giant aneurysms uh, in terms of perforation, though that's listed as a theoretical possibility. It's never been a practical possibility. So if it was asymptomatic, one would be having this patient on a single antiplatelet and NOAC uh, for a long time because they're recurrently present with unstable angina, ST, non-ST elevation infarctions, ST elevation infarctions, and CP rises repeatedly and regularly over a period of time. So you will use a combination of antiplatelet and anticoagulant. Correct. That's, this is the sort of situation where I use low river oxaban as well. Ashok, would you consider a covered stand here? No. Uh, you see, this is too, too diffuse to actually do with a covered stand. But yes, uh, giant aneurysms is one of the indications, either for surgery 
of a covered stents. And the way to cover these giant aneurysms, as you know, because they're not just size, it's longer. And, and, and these giant aneurysms mean they will, could be anywhere between six to 10 centimeters, uh, is, is actually putting telescope stents into a long, uh, long drug eluting stent, and then into that long drug, drug eluting stent, a 48 millimeter stent, and then you telescope uh, uh, covered stents into within the outer drug eluting stent layer, and you can seal these giant aneurysm. Surgery has been defined as the more important, you know, the first line treatment, but it's not unnecessary and fraught with complications. Also, the surgeons in this location can't mm -hmm. really reach the left main. So you can't, they can't do much beyond trying to just ligate as proximal as they get. Absolutely. You can't really relieve the aneurysm. Oh, Wishing, uh, maybe you can go back to you. So but in this case, very clear. In this case, no, 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 not closure of the aneurysms. This would be just medical therapy if it was just aneurysms in this area. But in this case, this could be surgery because he's got triple vessel disease. Do you agree with the etiology of Kawasaki? Ashok? So there, it, it can't be atherosclerosis in this young individual. Uh, I don't know what his past history was, were these aneurysms mm -hmm. present even when he had the first intervention. You have no history of that oh, okay. either. Yeah. Mm, so I would agree with Kawasaki's as the first diagnosis. This is Ibis. This is at a stent. Does anybody know the typical feature on Ibis of Kawasaki? Um, we'll ask our Christopher Ku. No, unfortunately, I don't have any idea about the IBUS appearance of Kawasaki. I haven't seen one. Anyone else know before I try to jump in? Dr. Gufren, Gimhui? Uh, no. So I, I don't know much about the histological appearance, but what I was told is that COVID late involvement in the arteries may look like Kawasaki's. So you get a mix of uh, microvascular obiturans, type of thrombosis, type of appearance, and uh, of course, this aneurysmal changes as well. So uh, in, the, in the microvasculature surrounding the coronary arteries. So you can see the huge aneurysm here. Okay, so it's more than eight millimeter here. I'm surprised your iris can image out <laughs> to eight millimeters. Yeah. That's right, yes. It's very nice clear, pictures. Huh? Yes, very nice pictures. Looks like the so, aorta. So angiogram indeed shows that uh, actually it's got triple vessel disease. The FFR across the ostium uh, and the approximate LED was 0 0.7. Uh, ostium of the LED is uh, 5.8. 4.1 was the approximate LED MLA. This is the echo. Does Kawasaki affect the valve, uh, Chris? Do you know? I guess there's MVP here, so I guess the answer is yes, but not that. <laughs> okay. oh. Do you think it's involved here? Or? I think it definitely is involved here. Oh. In what way? Uh, Looks thickened and looks like there's yeah. a bileaflet prolapse. Um, I don't know whether there's a correlation or whether they are related, but um, there's definitely severe MI. It looks like bileaflet prolapse here. Yes. Again, from what I know, when uh, someone showed me some specimens of late COVID uh, pathology specimens, uh, they do also have endocarditis and uh, valve involvement. The same pathophysiology as uh, uh, almost like late Kawasaki's involvement. Mm. Yeah, so that's, that's a median involvement. So this is a myxomatous degeneration. So I think that's, that's the link. Do you think this can be attributed to Kawasaki, Kashok? Yeah, I do. I do. When we put on the uh, color, you can see that there's actually quite a bit of uh, severe mitral regurgitation. Yeah. It's a bit eccentric though. But the LV function remains uh, normal. So we have a good EF, mitral valve prolapse, 
a moderate mitral regurgitation, and the diagnosis is indeed uh, Kawasaki's disease. Just want to talk so about Kawasaki. This, this is our write-up of this patient after we have done all the tests. Uh, just want to make a comment here is that ectasia and aneurysms are not all the time Kawasaki. Actually, atherosclerosis in the adults is probably the most common cause of coronary artery ectasia or coronary artery aneurysm followed by Kawasaki, followed by inflammatory disorder, which could include Takayasu, SLE, Wegener's granulomatosis, rheumatoid arthritis, giant cell arthritis, and microscopic uh, polyangiitis. But there are also compensatory dilatations that we see that can cause aneurysm ectasia, fistula, connective tissue disorder, mycotic aneurysm, and so forth. So connective tissue disease like uh, ehlers Danlos, Marfan, cystic media fibrosis, all this can cause ectasia uh, in the coronary arteries. So to, to qualify for Kawasaki, uh, you need to have a fever for five days and at least four of the following five uh, principal features. Uh, we know this is commonly a childhood disease, you need to have extremity changes, erythema, you need to have bilateral uh, conjunctivitis, cervical limb endonopathy, uh, polymorphous exanthem, and oral involvement, uh, strawberry tongue, cracked lips, and so far. But I just want to comment also on the uh, aneurysm. In patients who are treated with uh, uh, immunoglobulins and so forth, the aneurysm risk is 5%. Those untreated is 20 to 30% of uh, patients. But the interesting about it, even a patient who develop aneurysm, which occurs in about 40 to 60% in the early phase, uh, some can regress, some can go on to rupture, some can go on to remain to aneurysm with or without calcification, some can get occluded as well. And then even with occlusion, they can actually have recanalizations and collateral uh, forming. So the progression of an aneurysm is a little bit unpredictable in the patients with a Kawasaki disease. And these are the typical, the typical features of IVUS of Kawasaki is actually a thickening of the intimal media complex. So the whole intimal and media are thickened and some people liken it to a two layer appearance. So very, very thick uh, intimal and media. This is another classic uh, uh, picture of, on IVUS. This is called the lotus root appearance. So if you slice it open, you can see multiple channels here. Very interesting. This is because the uh, artery has been occluded and now it's been recanalized in different, many, many, small little chambers. So this is a lotus root appearance on IFS, classic of uh, Kawasaki. So can Kawasaki disease cause acute myocardial infarction? Yes, it can actually. Occurs in about 1.9% of uh, children who present with uh, Kawasaki disease. Death is 0.8%. Uh, this is uh, NUH, our first case of a uh, Kawasaki presenting with acute myocardial infarction. We also wrote it up. Uh, but it was a long time ago, <clears throat> 15 years ago. And so we can clearly see a thrombus in the, uh, in the ostium of the right uh, circumflex artery, aneurysmal, the uh, left uh, main, as well as the LAD artery. So actually, all the death in patients with Kawasaki's disease comes from cardiac sequelae. A sudden death from myocardial infarction may occur many years later in individuals with coronary artery aneurysm and stenosis. So our patients is actually at risk of a cardiac event. Most mortality occurs 15 to 45 days uh, after the onset of fever. The uh, pathophysiological mechanism underlying uh, MI in Kawasaki is actually the Burkhaus triad. You can have a hypercoagulable state. Uh, stenosis and aneurysm inlet can result in high shear stretch that activates platelets. You can have chronic thrombus in the aneurysm which presents fibrin and clotting precursors that amplify a clotting cascade can have endothelial changes, post stenotic turbulence activating endothelial uh, uh, lining and, uh, and platelet activation. And you, of course you can have flow changes. Uh, when you have a vessel dilatation and aneurysm, there's a low velocity flow and a relative stasis here. Patients with giant aneurysm of more than eight millimeter have the highest risk of thrombosis and subsequent myocardial infarction. And that's why anticoagulant and antiplatelet will be necessary in people with huge uh, aneurysm. Does Kawasaki disease affect the valve? Uh, you already answered. So in acute phase, you can have a uh, valvulitis, uh, but late onset uh, acute uh, aortic regurgitation or mitral regurgitation can occur due to, due to thickening or deformation of the uh, fibrous, uh, fibrous valves. Uh, this is surgically di difficult to repair. So most time you have to, uh, particularly when it occurs in a, uh, together with ischemic heart disease, so most time we have to replace it. 
So the final treatment of patients uh, from Malaysia, this is a uh, patient went for CABG, no way I can treat this uh, percutaneously. Surgeons also did a mitral valve alfieri repair to correct the mitral regurgitation. Uh, he did a ligation on both the proximal and distal LED calcified aneurysmal segment. And he's on long-term uh, warfarin uh, right now with me. And he's been well actually for 10 years right, after his bypass surgery. Thank you very much, uh, Ajay. Comment? So thanks, Wichim. Indeed, uh, again, a fantastic case. So we have three uh, great cases. I'll ask the fellows to see whether there's any questions from them first. Chris and uh, good friend, any questions uh, for our panelists as well as Wei Ching? No, nothing, but I think it was good to know about the Kawasaki and the valves for my... <laughs> and the Lotus like rule. Okay, um, so maybe before we finish now, I'd like to ask our panel to see whether there's any last teaching point for the cases and uh, final comments. Uh, we'll start with uh, Im Hui first. All the three uh, cases really illustrate how important for us to have an open mind. A lot of times we come in with a patient with a typical presentation and then uh, what, what uh, comes before eyes really can surprise us. So these exotic cases probably we will not see in our lifetime, but I think Hui Chim, great collection. I think I also learned so much from these cases. And once seeing once is enough for us to be aware of such a possibility in terms of the differential diagnosis. Thank you. So, so I'm, I'm just going to say that I think these are tremendous uh, cases. Let me first, some of the thoughts which came through when I was seeing those cases and which I want to amplify, and then I'll finally sum up. Uh, which in the first case, you saw at the end of the procedure, there was a Timmy 1 to 2 flow in the RCA. For the fellows, I just wanted to emphasize that your attempt should be in an acute MI to actually have a Timmy 3 flow at the end of the procedure. So when you implant a stent in a thrombotic vessel and get a, and there wasn't a stent implanted in that case, but there was a balloon dilatation done. It had a previous infarction and therefore you had a Timmy 3 2 flow. The ones who have a Timmy 1 and 2 flow, you may think you've left a patent flowing vessel, are the ones who actually do continue to have and conclude a major infarction. And while you come back a month later or two weeks later and find a rapidly flowing vessel, the damage is done because you haven't actually had a Timmy 3 flow at the end of the procedure. And these are the ones who then subsequently drop the ejection fractions over a period of time because of positive remodeling. So emphasis is that whether you instill uh, nitroprasol downstream, whether you instill adenosine downstream, you have to leave a table with a Timmy 3 flow at the end of a primary MI. That's a clear indicator for a long-term uh, outcomes and mortality. So that's my first, and, and LV function. So that's my first point. I think the cases were illustrative. There's always a way to stent uh, in uh, ectatic as well as aneurysmal vessels where you think that you've got to match it to the aneurysm and you don't, you just have to sometimes match it to the outflow of the aneurysm. And so if you've got a vessel which is aneurysmal and a stenosis at the outflow, you then just match it to the taper and match it to the distal vessel. And so you don't actually need to match it to the aneurysm. You just match it to the, the segment which tapers down towards normality and the aneurysm may be eight millimeters. But at some stage, it'll get to four and three millimeters. And that's where you match it to and go further beyond. So that's the second point. Thirdly, I, I, I may not have... So uh, uh, just the point I wanted to make about closure of aneurysms, and there's an algorithm you should all go through, which talks about and, you know, an aneurysm is anything which is more than twice the size of a, of a, a normal vas vessel, one, one and a half times the normal vessel, but then it's been divided into Sackler and uh, three types of aneurysms depending upon the, depending upon the, the length as well as the diameter. When you start coming to giant aneurysms, which have the highest chance of theoretical rupture in the long term, it's been suggested that those can either be treated on medical therapy, but the ones which are symptomatic with repeated, repeated MIs, uh, repeated distal embolization, CPK rises, should then be treated with either stent grafts or surgery. Surgery is very difficult. Stent grafts are easier 
but they're not long enough, as you know. And if they're not long enough, there is a, you know, a, cent, a, a giant aneurysm of eight to nine centimeters large, which was clearly greater than five centimeters in length. Uh, the ways to treat those are to firstly put drug eluting stents, telescope an outer layer of drug eluting stents into each other, going from normal segment to normal segment, and then telescope, telescope uh, uh, the, the covered stents, a stent graft into these drug eluting stents at different points rather than the outer layer of overlapping drug eluting stent. And then you actually have a good seal for the aneurysm, which can be long lasting. And that certainly is safer than any doing surgeries on these aneurysms. So that in general is the final comment I have to say for all of you is that it's great to be on panel of these sessions. The reason I come to the panel of these sessions and always I'm there is that it's the easiest task. You learn so much and yet you can pretend to be the most knowledgeable person when you sit on the panel. So I come to learn as well as to pretend that I'm the most knowledgeable person. And thank you, Hushim, and thank you, Jack, for creating such tremendous, tremendous learning experiences, not just for the fellows, but for all of us. It's a great, you know, it's it just every time I sit through this, I learn a few more things. Thanks, uh, Ashok. As usual, very eloquent and well said. I, I, my finishing comment is just to answer some questions uh, and comments uh, to highlight from the attendees. So one of our calling pathologists, uh, I think Dr. Eng Sui, uh, said that as a pathologist himself, it's very difficult or near impossible to diagnose extrinsic coronary compression because compression is usually functional like what Gimwe says, and the pulmonary artery collapses in the post-mortem state. So there's no way for him to tell whether the patient died uh, due to uh, extrinsic compression for a dynamic uh, pulmonary arteries. And um, there's a question which him, uh, for you. Uh, would you consider NOI instead of warfarin? as you're treating this patient, do you transit them to know it may be easier to use? Or are you comfortable actually, with it? I, I would actually, uh, but it's just that this patient is so comfortable with his warfarin has been going on uh, so stable for the last 10 years, so he doesn't want to change anything. So I'll just leave yeah. it as such, but I, I will go to know for sure. So like what uh, Ashok said, he's quite comfortable in knowing in the subgroup mm -hmm. as well. So low dose in combination, in combination with aspirin if there's a stent. Uh, and uh, maybe last question for Ashok then. Uh, Dr. Chong said, uh, in the first patient, if you want to do a deferred approach, how many days of anticoagulation is your general rule before repeating the coronary angiogram? So, so as early as three days, you can actually see the thrombus resolve. But I give them at least a week. I mean, there's no point having partial thrombus resolution and then saying, ah, it's resolving, let's come back in two weeks' time. So I get adequate time. Once you've got a flow, I just want to emphasize that the flow is the biggest lytic. And if you restore flow, you will gradually have the thrombus disappearing on even anticoagulation. So I get them back in a week's time to put a stent in. You can actually take two weeks to get a stent in, but don't bring them back early. Uh, you may have still residual thrombus burden in such large bulky thrombus. It takes time for it to disappear. Uh, uh, Jack, there's, there's, an, there's a question there, which was very interesting. And I want to address that explanation of, two, of, of for intracoronary 2B3 and choices. We must remember that the only 2B3, which has shown to have a dethrombosis effect on the table, and I would urge you to look up dethrombosis with apsiximab, huge amount of data, including the study which actually infused uh, uh, apsiximab in large bulky thrombus at the time of acute MI, which showed resolution of thrombus in front of your eyes on the table over a period of 10 minutes to, to 15 minutes. This dethrombosis effect is almost like a lytic effect, but it's not called a lytic effect. It only happens with apsiximab. So that is the reason why for large bulky thrombus, or why for stent, the reason for stent thrombosis is to use apsiximab while on the table and not... Uh, when you use other 2B3s, it's more over a longer term period that you actually infuse it over a period of uh, a day or two, two to see resolution of thrombus, but it doesn't happen instantly on the table as can happen with apsiximab. And finally, I did mention the TNK half dose. Remember it in your mind. It's a very useful technique. 
and large bulky thrombus at the wrong places where you can't get rid of the thrombus and still have TME one, TME zero, TME zero to one flow where you have to restore flow. That's your purpose at the time of a primary PCI or a bulky thrombus sitting in the left main at the wrong point where you still can't get rid of it. Half dose TNK, again, look up the literature. There's immense amount of anecdotal as well as small studies. Uh, and when you use it, it's, it's actually very, very rewarding to start seeing the disappearance of large bulky thrombus on the table in the cath lab. So you need to just look up my editorial on this called uh, uh, Once Upon a Time There Was Intracoronary Thrombolysis. I wrote that around five, seven years ago, again, on this case reports of uh, half dose TNKs for intracoronary thrombus during primary PCI. Thanks, Ashok. So maybe I just quickly recap and thank uh, everyone. First case, I think I just rehash again, the best thrombolytic is probably blood. So if you don't re-establish flow, nothing is going to work. So I think I'll take Ashok's point again, please re-establish at least Timitri flow. But the best outcome is those with a myocardial blood grade three as well. So don't forget the microcirculation on top of uh, re-establishing epicardial flow. I think right. that's important for primary PCI. In terms of agent, I don't have Ashok's experience of using half those uh, TNK and uh, increasingly Axismat is less used because of pricing and availability. I think that's a pity. I'm not too sure whether the trial Ashok is referring to is Cadillac. I'm not certain whether there's any other trial. Mm -hmm. um, it but, was infused, uh, I, 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 in, I think, was it an infused study that was using those those perforated balloons into the into the thrombus oh, okay. in acute Possibly, MI. possibly. Um, infused. But, but it's infusing once it's created flow, is, as long as there's a reflow. Uh, the other cases I thought the uh, good case to think of is a right-sided failure with uh, this uh, uh, persistent uh, hypoxia. I think you have to think of it as a different show. So that's something I never thought of. So that's thanks, Richim, again. And the third case, Kawasaki's, I think we also have to remember that Kawasaki also involved the microcirculation. The epicardial arteries can be open, but EF continues to be impaired in some of these cases. And uh, on, there are some cases that don't do as well as switching case, even with epicardial revascularization. I have a personal experience with a classmate of mine, actually, that ultimately needed a heart transplant for Kawasaki disease. So um, I, I also appreciate Huichim's sharing, and more importantly, you saw that Huichim and his team took an extra effort to publish these cases consistently across the years to get the message out. I think that's also very important uh, to share this uh, type of uh, cases in publications. So I, I'd like to thank uh, everyone, my panel, my two fellows, my attendees for today, and uh, particularly Huichim again for sharing his 25 years of experience for this series of cases. So we look forward to more sharing. I think he's still holding back from his coronary anomalies that he's hoping <laughs> to share with us next. So maybe the next round again then. Uh, and uh, thanks everyone for this Friday evening and uh, do keep safe. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye -bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful. Great program. Thanks. Bye.